Okay, right. people are rolling in. It's, we should have a nice big audience today. Um, welcome to MNR Wednesday, uh, 1st of February. And today is, is me great pleasure to, to have Richard Smith talk to us about this uh, wonderful project, uh, Metal Earth, uh, which he's going to tell us all about. Uh, but perhaps before I do that, I'll just... Uh, just remind, uh, remind you or, or tell those who, who came here through a different link that you can go onto this website on MTNet, the MNR's website, and there you'll find links to um, upcoming uh, MNR's and also uh, prior ones where we've got the YouTube video <clears throat> and the uh, presentation. <clears throat> now for February, I'm afraid we, <clears throat> we have a couple of spots. <laughs> Uh, because people dropped out. And so if any of you wish to, to present your research, then uh, please step forward and tell anybody on the MNR team, uh, myself, Kate, uh, Lindsay, Stefan, and Max, um, we have a spot next week, and we have a one at the end of February. Uh, but in two weeks' time, we're going to have Brian James on interferographic TEM method. Uh, but today we have uh, Richard Smith, <clears throat> who's going to talk to us about the geophysical contributions to the, the Metal Earth Project. <clears throat> now, Richard has, has got a wonderful pedigree, um, trained by some of the best in the world, uh, went to, got his degrees from Adelaide, and then went to, to Toronto and, <clears throat> and had, was very fortunate to, to be tutored and uh, supervised by Gordon West. And then he went to back to Australia uh, and was working with Kiva Vozov at Macquarie and then stepped into industry first in Australia and then Canada with uh, Lamontang and it's very unfortunate for those of you who are aware Eve uh, passed away a week ago. Uh, Geoterics, uh, CG Fugro. Uh, and then he moved into academia and is a professor at uh, Laurentian University. So uh, I'm going to stop my share there, Richard, and invite you to, to share your talk and uh, go ahead. Okay. I assume you can see my screen now. Yeah, looks good. Okay. I just have to get rid of that floating. Uh, I... Hide video panel, is that it? Hide floating meeting controls, there we go. Okay, so now I can see my full screen. And I just have to turn on the laser pointer. Okay, so uh, Thanks very much, Alan, for the introduction. And today what I'll be talking about is a review of the geophysical contributions to the Metal Earth Project. And uh, I'll be doing the review and the work that I'll be reviewing has mostly been done by the people that are listed uh, on this list of authors here. These are the principal geophysical authors, as you see, quite a large number of them. Most of them are from Laurentian University, including uh, Rasmus Halgaard and Taos Jorgensen. They're geologists that have uh, contributed the geological aspects of the first couple of examples. And I've also put in uh, a couple of people from uh, the University of Utah who helped with the MTN versions. So just as a little bit of background to start with, the Metal Earth Project is a multidisciplinary project in Canada, and the intent is to understand what controls where mineralization goes and hopefully why it goes where it goes. This is concentrated on Precambrian terrains. And the multidisciplinary aspects of it involve the geology, geochemistry, geochronology, but also geophysics. And the geophysics includes seismic, both active seismic and passive seismic, and also magnetotellurics. There was also some gravity and magnetics data that was collected and compiled. And we're also doing some borehole logging, but none of this work has been published yet, so it's not included in this review. 
And the Middle Earth project is primarily focused on the crust down to the core mantle boundary to try and understand that the pathways that the metals may have taken from the mantle, if that's where they came from, up to the crust, which is where we can find them. And the geology, geochemistry, and geochronology is primarily from the surface rocks. And the way that we are understanding what's going on in the shallow, mid, and deeper crust is primarily through geophysics. Now, just uh, some discussion of what the ultimate goals of the project are. And what we are seeking to do is to tell the difference between those areas that are endowed, where they're is known to be a lot of metals and those that are unendowed uh, where there are less metals. And the intent is to devise some sort of exploration strategy for identifying and finding the endowed areas rather than the unendowed areas. This map here just shows the study area. It's uh, concentrating on the superior uh, province and mostly the southern superior province down here. Uh, pinks are granitoids and tonalite intrusives. The greens are the greenstone belts. And today I'll be talking about uh, results from the Naranda, Matheson, and Larder Lake traverses in the Abitibi greenstone belt. I'll also show some results from Swayze, which is in the Swayze greenstone belt. Uh, and there are also some transects out here, four transects from Rainy River to Geraldton that are in the Wabagoon sub-province. And these ones are generally considered to be unendowed. So these are the 10 main traverses of the 13 that were part of the initial phase of the Middle Earth project. So the first uh, transect that I'm going to talk about is the Naranda transect, and this has been published uh, just late last year in Jorgensen et al. And uh, the rocks in here are mostly rocks of the Blake River group, which is this mostly green color you see here. Uh, and the Blake River group lies between the Porcupine Desta Fault, which is up here, and the Cadillac Larder Lake Fault down here. And our transect goes from the Porcupine Desta Fault up here uh, through these green rocks, which are mostly mafic to intermediate volcanics. The yellows are felsic volcanics and the dark blues you see here are uh, ultramafic volcanics. There are also some plutons. This is the Fabi pluton you see down here. Uh, these white and black uh, zones are uh, faults. So this is the Hunter Creek fault. Here's the Flavarian pluton. This is the Lac du Fo pluton. Uh, and you'll notice there are some red deposits here. These are VMS deposits that mostly occur in this zone. And as you get down towards this Horn Creek fault down here, you start to get some VMS deposits that also have gold in it. And these two here, the Horn deposit and the Kimont deposit, uh, are the two largest, 54 million tons and 17 million tons of copper, mostly. And then when you get down to the Cadillac Larder Lake Fault, you can see there are a number of gold deposits. These are the ones that are shown with the yellow dots. There are some other gold deposits here and other ones up here on the Porcupine Desta Fault. So that's the geological background that I wanted to point out to you. Okay, so that's the map view as put together by the, ge the geologist. And now we're going to go to the geophysics where we get to see some section views. So at the top here, we've got the map view uh, using that same color scheme that I talked about before. And we'll start off with the reflection seismic data. And you notice this zone in here, S1, there's not a lot of reflections, just one or two here. And this similar zone, S2, there's not a lot of reflections either, just a few. And these zones go down to about 14 kilometers depth here and about 10 kilometers or so depth here. And this non-reflective zone is what we call the upper crust. And below that, we get into what we call the mid crust, where you can see there are quite a lot of horizontal reflections. And in some cases, these reflections terminate like here and here and down here. So there might be some sort of structure running through here. 
Uh, and you can see it follows up through here, these terminations, and potentially we can trace it up to these two mapped faults here that are at the surface. So that's the seismic. And now we're going to look at the uh, magnetotelluric inversions. That's the colors. Uh, and they're underneath the seismic section again and the interpretation from the previous uh, panel over here. So you can see that there's a big conductive zone here labeled C5 that goes from the south to the north. And it seems to terminate at this structure that we identified before. And in fact, we see a conductive feature coming up here more conductive here where it's labeled C3 and again C3 up here. So this is a potential pathway for alteration, hydrothermal alteration and mineralization to move up along this fault. We also see a similar sort of moderately conductive zone running up here to C4 where we have the location of the porcupine dester fault. I also should point out that uh, the upper crust that was not very reflective here is highly resistive here and also highly resistive up here, although there's a zone of moderate resistivity uh, in this zone here. Now, those uh, copper and gold deposits I pointed out before sit on the Horn Creek Fault, which is here, and there's a conductive zone up here. Um, and that's where there's definitely mineralization, but there doesn't look to be any sort of pathway which joins this conductive material down here, which is a potential source of the metals to where the metals are up here. And that's a little bit puzzling. Okay, now I want to show you the interpretation that the geologists have done. So this annotation you see over the top is their geological interpretation. They have Blake River group growing down into about the mid crust, and then they haven't really identified anything down here. They've also got these faults that I've pointed out uh, and some intrusions as well. Okay, so I showed you the geophysics in section view, and that section was on this curved section that went down like this. But now we're looking at the magnetotelluric results in plan view, and you can see a number of patches. Uh, C3 uh, is here, uh, but there's a lot of conductive features down around through here. Some of these might be geological, but I suspect a lot of them have to do with infrastructure because there is a lot of mines and roads around here. Uh, and this is just the near surface. And the near surface often has spurious conductive features to explain static shifts and things like that. So let's go down to five kilometers below surface. And here we can see a conductor associated with C3. But generally at five kilometers, we have highly resistive upper crust, including through here uh, where the Horn Creek and Kimont deposits are. If we go down to 14 kilometers depth again, resistive, mostly along the section, except for C3, which is off a little bit to the north here, as you see. And this is at 23 kilometers depth. C5 is that, that, that big horizontal flat lying feature, and you can see it's quite extensive. Now, I want to focus on a section that's perpendicular to our section. Because this data was in 3D inversion with uh, hex MT, we have the uh, resistivities and conductivities in 3D. So we can actually extract another section that runs perpendicular to the section that we looked at before. So the before was down here, and this is our new section. And here it is. Uh, here's the Horn and Kimont deposits. And here's our C5. And here's all the resistive material in between the surface and C5. And this is where our section was before. And you can see it's resistive. But you'll notice now that C5 is actually joined to the conductive material at surface by this C2 conductor that, that heads out to the east, comes up vertically, and then come back, comes back to the west like this. So this is telling you that although we're looking at, we've collected data largely along a section, 
the results are actually in three dimensions, and we need to look at those three dimensional results in order to understand what the conductivity structure is and the potential mineralization pathways, because this C2 off to the side is the pathway that, uh, or it might be the pathway that fed these two rich VMS deposits up here. So that tells you that's important to look at the data in three dimensions. So this is a three-dimensional view, in this case, from the Southwest. Uh, there's C5 and here's C1 going out to the South and then coming back. C2 is the one that goes away from us and then comes back towards us. C3, you'll notice, goes out to the North and then comes back in again onto the section line. And there are lots of other conductors as well, too, that are evident in this data that aren't necessarily evident in the section view. And here are some other views as well, too. Okay, so that's uh, the Naranda transect. And now I want to move on and talk about the Matheson transect, which has been published in Halgard et al. So this is the reflection seismic data. Not a lot of reflectors up here in the upper crust some down here in the mid crust. And these seem to terminate at these arrows that you see here. So there's one termination here and there's another termination here where all these reflectors uh, come to an end. And this is indicating some sort of fault structure here and another fault structure here. And in the middle, there's virtually no reflections at all. So this is a potential uh, area that's been altered. So perhaps hydrothermal fluids have come up here. Uh, and here we know that this is the porcupine Desta fault in between this Tisdale group and the porcupine group. So there's a known fault here uh, and we've mapped on the seismic deeper faults down here slightly displaced. Now, if we look at the magnetotelluric section, Again, we've got resistive crust here and here, and we've got this big flat lying conductive feature at, uh, below 10 kilometers depth. And this zone that was identified as being a possible alteration zone, you can see is now conductive. So we can see a pathway where material from this flat lying zone may have migrated across and up through here. And then you can see a couple of little dots there that join up with where the porcupine desta fault is. So maybe the porcupine desta fault flattens off at... Uh, there's also another zone of conductive crust in the mid crust here as well too, and some other features. This is a regional um, magnetotelluric line over 100 kilometers. And the seismic data was only collected over about uh, 40 kilometers or so. This slide here is the same data that I just showed you, but now this is the geological interpretation that the geologists came up with, where they say they've got some lower crust, some mid crust through here, uh, and this um, fault zone through here. And then this is their interpretation of where the porcupine desta fault is associated with this large deep seated feature that they say uh, goes down to the mantle in this case. And I just want to point out that this area in here was the subject of a lot more detailed geophysics. So high resolution seismic and high resolution audio magnetotellurics through here. So I'm going to talk about that in more detail on these slides. So this is the um, 13 kilometer high resolution section through here. This is the geology, the lower Tisdale, the porcupine desta fault here. The, magneto, the magnetic inversion seems to indicate that it might dip to the south. Uh, there's a highly magnetic body here and another one out here where there's ultra mafic rocks. So this is the seismic data, high resolution seismic. And Again, not a lot of reflections. There's a reflection here at about eight kilometers depth. And there's one, two, three here. This one is um, at about um, two kilometers depth here. And this is the magnetotelluric data with a large resistor here. And these 
little conductive features here, a couple of blobs that sit on this porcupine dust of fog. So there's actually not a lot of good seismic data um, to resolve what the geology is. Uh, there's a lot of blobs here, most of the near surface features, a couple of features through here. Uh, it turns out that to best understand what the geology is and to work out what the thickness of the porcupine assemblage was, uh, the best way to do it was this reflector here was interpreted as being the bottom of the porcupine. So that's here. And uh, otherwise, this basal topography of the porcupine was really determined using the gravity data that you see here. And it was determined to be about um, uh, and a half to two and a half kilometers deep. So this is the final interpretation of the high resolution study area, which you can see here. These are the seismic reflectors and the colors were filled in, in this case, by the gravity. You'll notice that that eight kilometer reflector that I talked about before uh, was interpreted by the geologists as being a banded iron formation. And banded iron formations often sit near the top of the DeLauro assemblage. And so this was interpreted as being, it was extrapolated out to the north and to the south as a flat line feature. And also because there was no information, it was in, extrapolated to the west as being also flat lying. So uh, this was hypothesized to be the DeLauro assemblage. And that was as published in uh, 2021. Now, uh, that high resolution seismic section I showed you was this one here. This is the Middle Earth section. Uh, and this is the uh, reflector at eight kilometers. There are two other Middle Earth seismic sections this one here, C, is a few kilometers to the west. B is a few kilometers even more to the west. And then A here is the Shillington line, which was collected as part of the Discover Abitibi project. And you notice that there's a reflector here that's about seven kilometers deep. And here there's another reflector that looks to be five. And here there's one that looks to be around three kilometers deep. So if this is the DeLauro, what is this here? and this one here, and this one here. So the question is, could this be the DeLauro and could it be getting shallower? So that's a, a geological hypothesis that we have. All we have is some reflectors. We don't know what's above and underneath those reflectors. So we wanted to look at some evidence to see whether or not the DeLauro was getting shallower. And what we looked at was the gravity data. So we made a gravity model where here the DeLauro was eight kilometers deep. And then as you headed west, it got shallower and shallower. And we uh, determined that shallowness or how sh quickly it got shallow from the seismic data. Once we'd fixed that depth, we had to remodel the thickness of the porcupine assemblage so that um, on profiles, the gravity data agreed with it. Uh, and then we put that into the model. Uh, and fix the geometries. So the question is, can the material in between these interfaces uh, be what we think it is and still be consistent with the gravity data? So what we did was we varied the densities of the material in between according to what um, we had in terms of the geology. So this light green is the lower Tisdale. And we have a petrophysical database where we know what the densities of a large number of Tisdale samples are. So we know what their mean is and we know what their standard deviation is. So in the initial model, we set their density to be the mean density, but we allow the inversion to adjust their densities within the standard deviations. So they don't go less than the mean minus the standard deviation, and they don't go up uh, above the mean plus the standard deviation. They don't go more than that. So they lie within the mean plus or minus the standard deviation. And when you adjust the densities in the Tisdale and the porcupine assemblages, 
So you have slightly different variations of shades of blue here and different variations of shades of yellow through here. You get a fit to the measured gravity data that has a chi um, squared value that is uh, comparable to one, which tells you that our model is consistent with the gravity data. So that means that our hypothesis that the, the Deloro assemblage is getting shallower is actually um, uh, consistent with the gravity data. So that means the hypothesis uh, that we put forward is actually feasible. And that's an interesting ex example of how gravity data can tell you about what's going on at depths of up to eight kilometers um, when uh, you have constraints from the seismic data. So it has to be constrained gravity inversion. Now I'm going to move on and talk about the Larda Lake transect. And uh, this is a transect that runs north or, or runs from south to north. And it crosses over the Cadillac Larda Lake fault, which you see here on the, this is the, up the top here was the surface geology map. Uh, and down the bottom here is the reflection seismic. And you can see that if we extrapolate this Cadillac Larder Lake fault down here, looking for places where these reflectors terminate, we can map the um, Cadillac Larder Lake fault all the way down to the, um, down to the Moho, or almost to the Moho. There's also another fault here called the Lincoln Nipissing Shear that doesn't have a strong character on the seismic data. There's lots of reflectors here in the mid crust, uh, and this has been interpreted as the top of the mid crust. There's also a non reflective zone down here, which is a potential hydrothermal, um, uh, hydrothermally altered area. And there are some other faults here that have also been recognized. So that's the reflection seismic data. Uh, at Larder Lake. Now, at Larder Lake, we also did some experiments with passive seismic data to see what additional information could be extracted from the passive, passive seismic data. So uh, this is the ambient noise surface wave tomography data that was collected and processed by SysProbe. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but I want to talk on this slide mostly about the receiver function analysis. Uh, which was done by SysProbe. And the colors that you see here is the amount of uh, convertibility between the P waves and the S waves. So if where it's red, it's uh, highly convertible, and where it's blue, it's the negative of it. So you can see there's a very strong anomaly associated with the MOHO through here. Uh, and there's also another anomaly here that looks to be dipping to the south. And this feature has been interpreted by different people in different ways. Some people have interpreted this as some sort of subduction zone, but other people have interpreted it as a uh, piece of the crust that is delaminated off the bottom of the crust and is falling down into the mantle. So I point out this is just uh, 30 kilometers from here to here. Here's the Cadillac Lard Lake Fault that we saw before. And you notice this red feature terminates here. This blue feature terminates. This red feature sort of terminates, but this one crosses right over. There are also other patches uh, of lows through here and highs through here as well, evident on this uh, convertibility section. And uh, you can generate the convertibility sections from different frequency bands. In this case, this is the result from the averages of all the frequency bands going from 0.1 up to 3 hertz. OK, now I'm going to talk in more detail about this ambient noise uh, shear wave tomography. And up here, I've got the reflection seismic section, but just from the top 10 or so kilometers. And you can see that there's a strong um, interface here, the bottom of which has been marked B1. Here's another interface, the top of which is marked B2. And here's another one, B3. And there are also some other ones, P2 here, P3 here, 
and P1 here. So that's the reflection section. And now when you look at this ambient noise shear wave tomography, you see, and you plot these um, reflection interfaces on them, you can see that there's a rough correlation. So this B3 here, you can see that there is higher shear wave velocities below it. And for this B2 here, there is lower shear wave velocities below this, higher shear wave velocities below P1. And B1 and P2, are um, this is low shear wave velocity surface material and then higher velocity below it. So the advantage of this ambient noise shear wave uh, interpreted data is that you can take your interfaces and you can fill in what's above them or below them using this shear wave tomography data. Now, this is the P to S convertibility, but now we're looking at the very high frequency band uh, because we want to identify high resolution shallow features on this shallow section. And so in this case, you can see that there is indeed some correlation of the reflections with these black lines and highs or lows uh, in the um, convertibility section. Okay, now I'm going to move across to another um, transect, and that's the Swayze transect, which is to the east of Matheson, I'm sorry, to the west of Matheson. Uh, it's a greenstone belt, and it's right next to this um, major fault here and the Kappus casing structural zone to the, to the west. There are some green magnetotelluric um, stations here that are legacy broadband stations. And uh, it looks to me like these were trying to understand a little bit better about what was going on between the Kappus casing zone and the Abitibi greenstone belt um, to the east here. But we're adding to that these red magnetotelluric stations, which are collected as part of the Metal Earth project. So we have um, data covering a fairly large area here, a three-dimensional data set. So we can do a three-dimensional inversion in this case and get a good idea of what's going on in the uh, Swayze Greenstone Belt. I just want to point out that the Porcupine Desta Fault is up here to the north. And there are two faults down here, the Rideout Fault and the Rundle Fault. And these faults are believed to be related in some way to the Cadillac Larder Lake Fault. Okay, and I also wanted to point out that the red circles, some of them are broadband MT, but these close together ones here and here are also um, or are AMT stations, much closer together, 300 meters or so apart, uh, to give us higher resolution near surface information. So this is the regional data, uh, mostly the broadband magnetotelluric data going down to fairly long periods. Uh, and this is the regional uh, resistivity section, as you see here, and you'll notice as well that there is a large flat line conductor in the mid crust at about 20 kilometers depth. There's a lot of conductive features at surface and there is two vertical conductors that join this horizontal conductor with a near surface features. So this is vertical conductor one and this is vertical conductor two through here. These ones here, C1 and C2, these are only really uh, um, being influenced by station, a couple of stations. Uh, they're at the end of the line, so we're less certain about these. And I just wanted to point out that um, the inversion here started off using just the impedance tensor Z, uh, and then that the results from that impedance tensor Z inversion were used as the starting model and the a priori model for an inversion that had both the Z and K, which is the induction vector, the tipper, 
uh, included in it. So this is the final section after having gone through and tested enough number of different ways of doing the inversion. This was judged to be the, the best one. It included both the, the impedances and the induction vectors to give you a better sense of what's going on and to give you a better three-dimensional result as well too. Okay, so now I'm going to concentrate on these two high resolution sections where we inverted just the audio magneto telluric section. And we're hoping to be able to extrapolate these vertical conductors VC1 and VC2 up to the surface and see how they connect with the mapped faults, the Rundle fault and the porcupine dester fault. So we'll call these uh, high resolution section south and high resolution section north. So here are the data. So these are the audio magneto telluric data, and these are the uh, broadband data. And when you invert just these using a half space as your initial guess uh, and your a priori model, you get something that looks like a layered earth. You basically get more conductive at depth and less conductive at surface. And that's consistent with the phases, which you can see are generally increasing as you go to longer periods. And this VC1 that we saw before, we don't see an indication of that in this inversion. We do see an indication of VC2, uh, but the resistor R2, which is to the right of VC2, maybe I'll just go back and show you that data. So here's VC1, and to the right of it is R1. And here's VC2, and to the right of it is R2. Highly resist, two highly resistive zones. And when you look at this inversion here, R1 is here, and there's an R1 there, and R2 is here, and there's not really an R, a resistive zone here. So this inversion where we used a half space model wasn't judged to be very good. But when we started, our initial model as the regional model, and we assumed that the a priori model was a half space, we got VC1 here, continuing up to the surface and perhaps going here. Uh, and we did get R1 in the correct place. VC2, we got it appearing and going from depth up to surface. And we didn't get a very strong R2. If we used the regional model as our a priori model, then we got much better continuity between our regional one with VC1 coming up vertically and then coming around like this, and VC1 coming up here. And we also got this resistive zone R2 where we wanted it to be. So this is an interesting um, study from the point of view of people that are interested in magnetotelluric inversions. It gives you uh, an indication of one way that you can um, merge data from broadband magnetotelluric surveys to AMT surveys and get a result that's consistent across both types of surveys. I didn't mention this work was published in uh, Hill and Others, EPSL. Now, this is the Geological interpretation, uh, which um, was come up with input from another geologist. Uh, and uh, you can see here that uh, these uh, gold deposits are known as orogenic gold deposits. So there's some type of orogeny that took place. So when this these arrows here um, compressed the crust, you got some thrust faulting and fluid flowed up along these thrust faults, as you see here. And then later on, after the orogeny, um, the, um, the crust settled back to its previous position here. And you can see that there is um, now these thrust faults become normal faults, and there's left behind some remnant of the uh, thrusting. And these might be conductive. And here's another one that's conductive. So this might be V1, and this might be uh, VC1, and this might be VC2. And then this zone down here is that uh, horizontal conductor that we talked about. So that's a, um, a cartoon explanation of what we see.
So the geophysical conclusions are we have reflectivity in the low um, and uh, we, we have, for the, from the seismic data, we have low reflectivity in the upper crust and we have stronger reflectivity in the mid and sometimes in the lower crust. And from our magnetotelluric data, we get sub-horizontal conductive zones in the mid crust. Uh, and sometimes we get narrower vertical zones that go up into the upper crust through otherwise resistive material. Uh, and these might be associated with hydrothermal fluids and metalliferous material going up to deposits. The passive seismic data that we collected is generally consistent with our other data and can be used to fill in the gaps in between the reflection events. The receiver function analysis can explore much deeper than our reflection seismic data. Um, that MOHO and that dipping feature S1 uh, went down to about 70 kilometers depth. And we use gravity data uh, to model features down to about 10 kilometers depth and confirm our hypothesis that the DeLoro was shallowing to the west. And in that Swayze example, I showed you um, that regional and local scale MT and AMT can be merged together and combined to give a section which shows something that's consistent with both data sets. So that's our geophysical conclusions, but our exploration conclusions are much more tentative. What I showed you was a number of different interpretations and you might have noticed that each of these interpretations of our geophysical data uh, were quite different uh, on the different sections. They had different styles and they didn't look very similar. And that was because the interpretations were done by different groups on different transects. And so we don't have any sort of uniformity in our interpretations. So what we're seeking to do now is to try and focus the project on looking at the data in a uniform way and comparing one section to another and so as to understand the differences between those sections which are endowed and those which are unendowed and that is ongoing right now and hopefully we'll have some conclusions about that in the next few years um i just like to acknowledge these two companies here for their acquisition and processing of the seismic data. And these two companies here for acquisition and processing of the magnetotelluric data. And I mentioned SysProbe that collected and processed the passive seismic data. Uh, we're grateful to these companies for supplying us with software to uh, process, display, and interpret our data. And um, the work we're talking about was funded by the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. So that's from uh, transect part of the Middle Earth project, the transects in the uh, Superior Province. But there's also a part of the Middle Earth project that is has some transects in oceanic crust. So this is called the Metal Oceans part of the Middle Earth project. And I've uh, reviewed some of the published work on this as well too, and I've discussed it with uh, Mark Hannington, and I've got a little summary for you if you're interested in this. So the Middle Oceans Project relies on the principle of uniformitarianism put forward uh, uh, more than 100 years ago by Hutton and Lyle. And uh, in this, we're assuming that the modern ocean is the key to the ancient ocean. It's not necessarily exactly the same, but some important aspects of it will be the same. So when we look at Archean crust, we notice that there's a lot of volcanic rocks, both mafic and acidic and felsic. We also notice in the Archean crust that in these volcanic rocks, there are a lot of pillow structures and sedimentary basins, and both pillow structures and sedimentary basins are indicative of a marine environment. So that's consistent with it being below the ocean. Also, in the Archean crust that we look at, when we look at a greenstone belt, we see that there are a number of time periods when continental crust was created in that sea, in the marine environment, but then preserved on continents. And we notice that mineral deposits are often associated with many of these. 
And so the Middle Oceans Project is looking at the Lao Basin, where there is oceanic crust that's currently being created. And this could potentially also become continental, or at least crust similar to it could become continental. And also the Lao Basin is endowed with metal. So it's a good place for us to do this Middle Oceans Project. So just to give you an idea of where the Lao Basin is, Australia, New Zealand, this is the Tonga Trench running up through here. And the Lao Basin is this area in here. So that's the regional location. If we zoom in on it, this is the actual bathymetry. So this is the Tonga Trench, which is very deep. And then there's this Tonga Ridge. Uh, and then there's the Lao Ridge that you see through here. So that's uh, basically the bathymetry. Now, this is the Tonga Ridge and this is the Lao Ridge. And those two are being separated from each other by this spreading center through here. So this is a back arc spreading center. Also, I wanted to point out this Louisville Seamount chain. So this is a chain of formerly uh, active volcanoes. And uh, they're about to be, these two are about to be subducted. But perhaps there are some other ones in here, up to the north, that have already been subducted. OK, so when we take this bathymetry data and we look at it in a great deal of detail, then we look for places where the bathymetry suddenly changes. And those are lineaments that we can draw these little black lines on. So these black lines show the lineaments. This is the fabric of what's going on there. Uh, other lineaments were also derived from the satellite altimetry data and also from the gravity gradient data, which are a little bit broader uh, wavelength features. I should just mention that this uh, material is um, presented in Baxter et al. Uh, Baxter et al. also compiled all the earthquakes that occurred in the Lao Basin. And you can see there are quite a number of earthquakes. Most of them are shallow earthquakes associated with the spreading centers. Uh, the principal ones you see here are green and yellow. And the green ones are right lateral strike slip ones. And the yellow ones are left lateral strike slip. And when you get that sort of thing going on, um, these strike slip transformations, um, they're often analogous to blocks sliding next to each other. So left lateral is what you see here. And you can get that sort of left lateral um, situation where you have many left lateral faults side by side, as you see here, uh, when you have some sort of rotation, in this case, a clockwise rotation. But if you have uh, right lateral, such as you see here, then you might have an anti-clockwise rotation going on. So that tells you that there's complex rotations going on up in this Lao Basin, even more complicated up here as well, too. There's also some strike uh, slip ones up here, these orange ones as well, too. Down here, we have normal faults, and these are typical of a spreading center. So what we expect in a spreading center is just normal faults. This is the back arc spreading center, but you can see once we get up here, it starts to get a lot more complicated. Uh, and some of these spreading centers that you see up here uh, become uh, transform faults, such as the Peggy Ridge fault that is through here. So uh, this is the um, plate tectonics map. This is the trench, subduction zone. This is the spreading center. Here's some other spreading centers, left lateral, right lateral through here. This is the Peggy Ridge, which is a transform fault. There's other spreading centers through here. And there's some um, quite complicated things going on. Notice that there aren't many earthquake solutions down here. Uh, and this zone, therefore, might be locked because this Louisville Seamount chain has been subducted down here. Uh, and those mounts are basically creating friction to lock the uh, subduction zone. So down here, it's fairly simple. It's subduction zone with a back arc spreading center. 
And as I said, there's no spreading at the Louisville Seamount chain. Whoops, I'm going the wrong direction, I think. No, oh, I am. All right. Now up here, uh, it's a lot more complex. We have growing spreading centers, or the red are spreading centers that are growing. In between them, there are these microplates here. The green are the names of the microplates. And there are lots of triple junctions in here. Uh, these spreading centers, such as you see here, merge into uh, transform faults, such as the Peggy Ridge fault you see here. There are transcurrent deformation zones. And here's one here and one down here. This one's left lateral, this one's right lateral. And there are also some extensional deformation zones, like this area that you see here. And generally up here, we have very slow spreading, but at many locations. And so that means there's a lot of uh, oceanic crust being created here. Now, uh, this data that I've just showed you, plus other data, uh, gravity, magnetic bathymetry, and dredge samples was used to generate the geological map that you see here. So this is one of the outputs of the Metal Oceans Project put together by Meg Stewart and others and published in Geosphere. And this is their geological map. Now, one of the things that they noticed when they looked at their geological map and the associated geochronology was that the Lau Ridge was as old as about 50 million years and the Tonga Ridge was as old as about 50 million years. But these assemblages up here that are around 5 million years old are much younger. And these are caught, all occur in those microplates up to the north. This is where there's complicated stuff going on. And it's just going on over a 5 million year period. And these sorts of time ranges are comparable to what we see in the Archean, generally 50 million years for a greenstone belt, but some of the activity, like in the Blake River group, might be over a much shorter time period. So the geological conclusions are there's a mix of active and relic arc and back arc crust that is being generated in the Lau Basin. And these have been assigned assemblages names and ages. And it's noted that in the last 3 million years, there's lots of failed rift, ridge jumps, deformation zones, and generally slow rates of accretion in many, spreadings, in many of the spreading centers. And there are many triple junctions. And those triple junctions can be zones of weakness through which mantle material can rise up and through. So that's how material can come from the mantle and metals can move up and be deposited near the upper crust. Uh, the faster spreading that we see to the north, maybe because the Louisville seamount chain um, is no longer blocking the trench, and so spreading can occur much more quickly up to the north. But that's just a hypothesis. So that's the geological background. Now I want to give you some very brief um, results from a geophysical profile, and this is published in Schmetterdahl. Um, and this is the location of the profile, which is in the southern part of this more complicated area. So there was refraction data and reflection data. So this is the refraction data that's been inverted to work out what the velocities, the P wave velocities are. And you can see they're gradually increasing. Uh, fairly low here. Uh, and it goes above six when where we get, or 6.5 at this red line, and then it goes up above eight at this dark green line here. And this is interpreted as being the MOHO. You can see these are the uh, ray paths, and there's one set of refractions along the MOHO reflector, but there's another set of refractions here, just below that 6.5 kilometer contour. So there seems to be two distinct layers in the crust, an upper crust, and a lower crust in this case. And this is the seismic reflection data, which is only going down about a kilometer or so. This is a different scale than this. But you'll notice what look like sedimentary basins here and here and here. And so we get sedimentary basins in the um, Archean greenstone belts. The porcupine assemblage that I talked about is a sedimentary 
uh, basin, just a small one, but nonetheless, here's one here. Uh, these red features here are interpreted as being sills, and we often get sills in ancient greenstone belts. And the green features that you see here are interpreted as being normal faults. Difficult to see on this section, but if you look at a, a much larger uh, version of it, you'd probably see them more easily. Gravity modeling has also been undertaken, and this also shows a difference um, between the mid crust and the lower crust. So the geophysical conclusions um, are that the geophysical studies reveal complex microplate structure in the northern Lao Basin. And this developed in the last 3 million years. There are weaknesses at triple junctions, which could allow upwelling of mantle material, which might be endowed with metals. The crust shows variable thickness that's similar to that seen in the Archean upper crust. So um, if I go back and show you some of those, you can see that this depth here is about seven kilometers down to about 10 kilometers. That's comparable with the sorts of depths that we're talking about of the upper crust in the Abitibi greenstone belt. And also seals are evident in the thicker parts of the arc and uh, we also still see seals in the Archean. So this work that I've just been talking about, the Metal Oceans work, um, is uh, part of the Metal Earth project, uh, but it also has a great deal of collaboration with the Germans through GeoMAR and uh, IMAGE. Okay, so that's all I have. I'll stop sharing. There we go. Absolutely. Brilliant, Richard. Thanks very much. I hadn't known about metal oceans. And I think this is wonderful that you're trying to look for correlatives between uh, ancient processes and modern processes. And I guess we could spend the next five hours debating whether Archean processes are the same as modern subduction processes. Yes, um, I don't, I, I'm not sure that they are the same, but I, yeah. we are hoping that there are a few things that are the same that we can recognize in the, right. in the ancient right. crust. Right. Yeah. So uh, please uh, put your questions in the Q&A and um, I'll read them out so they get in the uh, the recording. Um, I'll, I'll start off by by asking um, a very simple question, and that is. Where are you going? I mean, what's I know I know you've still you've got five more years, four more years of Metal Earth. You've just been extended. What what's planned? Uh, for the next few years from the geophysical perspective? Well, um, I mentioned that we're going to be uh, looking at similarities and differences between the endowed and the unendowed. Um, but also one of the objectives of the Metal Earth Project was to take what we'd learnt in the fairly well-known and understood southern superior uh, and take that to the north. So we had been thinking of going to the ring of fire, but it's rather difficult to get to the ring of fire. That's in the northern superior. So we're actually planning surveys now in the slave province uh, and hoping that we might see some similar features there. Mm -hmm. And the work in the slave is a lot more grassroots exploration work than the work is in the um in the superior province great um you got a a long comment from from jerry there's not really a question uh but in jerry's uh comment but i'll read it out because it you know it, it does congratulate you richard excellent exposition of lots of uh, enlightening data in a geological complicated sex sectors leading to lots of speculative inferences. Good to keep alternative explanations in mind and that current trustal rocks are largely folded and tilted from our key and depositional conditions and cool and stable for the past uh, two billion years with VMS deposits having largely formed on the flanks of volcanic complexes and hence poor response for most crustal rocks with seismic reflection. 
Differences in empty models are a good example of dependence on assumptions and starting conditions. Well, I, we could talk about that for the next five hours. <laughs> Look forward to much further discussion at PDAC. Uh, so I don't know whether there's anything there, Richard, that, that you would like to touch on, or should we move on to uh, the next question? Yeah, just one comment. Um, people often talk about the uh, greenstone's belts being folded. They talk about these sort of uh, fold axes running through the greenstone belt. And often the basis for that is that they have, for example, younger rocks in the middle and older rocks on the outside. And the way you can get that is by having some sort of syncline. But another way that you can get it is by having a spreading center. So if you think of things from a little bit of a different perspective, maybe uh, the geology isn't quite as we understand it. So there's, you know, there's certainly different perspectives that can come from that Metal Oceans um, project. Yep, yep. Um, Andy Calvert um, asking, why were the metal seismic reflection data not recorded to times greater than 12 seconds, which would allow clear identification of the base of the crust, i.e. the moho, from downward termination of lower crustal reflectivity, and potentially fossil subduction or delamination zones in the mantle. Yeah, that's a good question. I think everyone would like to have seen down to the moho and a little bit deeper, but, you know, there's always a trade-off, right? So if in order for you to see deeper you have to sit for a little bit longer at each station and that's going to increase the cost proportionately so uh you know you always have to make compromises in this case i guess we thought well if there's some sort of structure that's going down to to the full 12 seconds which is about 36 kilometers maybe it'll go all the way down to the mantle which is 38 kilometers so uh I guess that's sort of the answer. I know it's not completely satisfactory, but uh, uh, that's the best I can do for now anyway. Uh, ben Murphy. Uh, hi, Ben. He's asking, particularly regarding the Naranda section, can you say more about your interpretations regarding the causes of deep elevated electrical conductivity and how that relates to deposits? particularly wondering about deep linkages to VMS deposits since generic models for those deposits focus on upper crustal hydrothermal processes. Deep linkages for orogenic gold make more sense to me. Mm, okay, so... Um, the linkages... Yeah, so I guess there's two aspects to it. There's the deep elevated electrical conductivity, which is that big flat lying thing. Mm -hmm. And the Swayze example that I talked about discusses that in some detail. If you go to the paper by Hill et al. in EPSL, they discuss what might cause that. It's not really clear what the actual conductive material is. Our preference is for it to be graphitic material or possibly sulfides that may be electrically connected with each other. Um, and the evidence that we have for it may be graphitic comes from the capus casing structural zone where deep crustal material was thrust up to the surface and geologists have found graphite in that capus casing structural zone. So that's some sort of supporting evidence for that. Um, now, yes, a VMS deposit is a near surface thing, just local hydrothermal processes, you might argue, but the heat has to come from somewhere and the heat might be coming from some sort of uh, spreading center, for example, because often these occur near spreading centers. So if you've got a spreading center, you've got, uh, a plate boundary and that plate boundary is going to go to great depth so that might be the connection 
And then at some later point, that plate boundary is going to be a zone of weakness that later becomes a fault uh, that's active. So for example, the porcupine dester fault might at one time have been um, a um, plate boundary. Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, I mean, I think the um, in the EM community or the NT community, we have a real problem trying to explain these large conductors that we're seeing in a number of regions around the world, um, particularly Australia uh, have shown a huge number of these now. And uh, we don't know really what it is. And uh, I know Ben is an advocate. Ben Murphy is an advocate for uh, graphite. And you did mention the capus casing. The odd thing about the uplift is the capus casing uplift low crystal rocks are not conducting. So mm. something happened when, when it got uh, uplifted. Anyway, let's uh, let's pass on to Weijun Weijun Zhao. Are there any drill holes on geophysical profiles? If so, are there comparisons between geophysical results and well logging results? Yeah, so uh, there are some drill holes along the profiles. Um, uh, where available, we've uh, looked at these. Uh, and these are often, you know, drilling for specific specific economic targets. So uh, often they're quite shallow. They give us an idea of where the porcupine test defaults going at shallow depths, but not necessarily at greater depths. Um, and as far as well logging results go, um, we've done some well logging. But well logging isn't commonly done in the mineral exploration business. So yeah. there's some work that we're doing at the Cadillac uh, Lada Lake faults. Um, and hopefully that will give us some sort of indication of, uh, of how this relates. So that's, that's still to come, that work that's ongoing. Uh, excellent question from, uh, from Dennis Woods. Hi, Dennis. Um, Interesting compilation of the big picture of superior geology. What lessons can a mineral exploration company take away from all this research to help them find VMS and OG deposits besides look in the green rocks? Yeah, well, that's a good question. So that's sort of what we're hoping to be able to say in the next part of the project to actually um, uh, give mining companies some sort of indication of where to look for. So uh, just from extrapolating some conclusions from what I've showed you, we one thing you could do is you could say, well, if there are some source rocks or some sort of intermediate reservoir where these metals are held, maybe they're associated with these big flatline conductors. And so one thing you can do is you can look for those big flatline conductors and where they're large, they could be a large resource and where there's some sort of indication of a potential pathway from them up to the surface, that's where we may look for um, mineral deposits. So um, right now, I guess that's uh, what we're saying. And actually it's sort of interesting because we did seismic, MT and passive seismic um, on these transects. And we're getting a lot of interest from the industry on the magnetotelluric results. So since these early transects were done, we've done other magnetotelluric surveys at Timmins and at Red Lake. And what we're planning in the slave is also a magnetotelluric survey. So uh, there's certainly a lot of interest in magnetotellurics. And uh, hopefully as we you know, gather and analyze more, people will start to see what it is that information, that magnetotelluric information can tell us. Yeah, we have probably one last question. Um, Lyle Harris, um, are there plans to add additional geophysical studies over some of the potential but poorly defined discontinuities arising, arising from David Mole's Metal Earth Isotope Studies. Perhaps you need to just give us a couple of minutes on David Mole's Metal Earth Isotope Studies. 
Yeah, I'm not so familiar with those, actually. So I think Lyle might know quite a bit more about it than I do. Um, but I think it's based on some work that he did originally in Western Australia, where he found that the isotope studies could identify different regions of the Yulgarn craton that otherwise you might not have been identified as being different. So um, we've been trying to do the same thing in the Superior Province. And he had some preliminary results, but we've got other people that are continuing to work on it. So I think maybe once that work is better um, or is completed, the poorly defined discontinuities that Lyle refers to may be a little bit better defined, and maybe then it might be appropriate to do some additional geophysical studies over them. Okay, well, again, thanks very much, Richard. Absolutely wonderful presentation. And um, this presentation is, has been recorded and will be available in a few hours on uh, on the uh, MTNet uh, YouTube channel. And uh, Richard, I, I believe you have agreed to share your uh, uh, presentation as a PDF. Yeah. And we can- Yes, we can, yes, yeah. I have. I'm just, I'm just noticing in the chat here, David Schneider's answered Andy Calvert's question. Uh, uh, thanks, David, for jumping in on that because yeah. David helped to design most of the reflection seismic surveys. And he says, uh, we can do extended correlation of the 12 seconds down effectively to 14 to 16 seconds. Uh, we use the broadband up sweep, so they are only losing high frequencies at depth where they do not penetrate. So hopefully that answers Andy's questions. Yeah, yeah, somewhat. Okay, brilliant. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for again very much, Richard. And uh, we ha don't have a seminar next week. Uh, so I'll see everybody in two weeks time. Thanks very much. Bye for now.